This is a production of Cornell University. So thanks for the opportunity. This is not going to be your typical scientific seminar. Um, I'm going to cover the basics of climate change. Bear with me. I'm an entomologist. I'm not a climate scientist, but I've also dedicated an awful lot of time of learning the science of climate change. So I'm going to cover the basics. Then we're all going out to dinner. Get your credit card out because we're going to have an expensive meal, but the point is what's changing on the menu. And then I'm going to talk uh, about uh, what Cornell is doing, both a little bit from the academic side, which you're all part of, but also facilities and operations. There really is a lot going on. And we just launched a report from the Senior Leadership Sustainability Group on a set of recommendations to get us to carbon neutrality by 2035. So I'm going to summarize that. And Tony failed to mention that this, our latest publication, we actually published together, made the front cover of Weed Science. My picture is on the front. No, was that it? No. No, oh, okay, well, whatever. Okay, so Tony and provide a little bio, but I'm going to add a few more things. Uh, here I am milking a cow in Costa Rica a few years ago. It's one thing you never forget, and that's like riding a bike. You never forget how to milk a cow, and the tour guide was just blown away that I could milk a cow, and I did it rather effectively. I also got really excited about this anaerobic digester back there, and he said, we've never had a tourist who could milk a cow and got it excited about the manure. Uh, I grew up on a little farm in Wisconsin, had a pet crow named Carl, although recently I realized it may have been Carla, but you know, when you're nine years old, you don't have that kind of conversation with your pets. Spend time in the Marine Corps, Vietnam veteran. I tell this story because it helps with a lot of different audiences. I'm not just a professor going to talk to this group. I'm part of it. Um, I've also held leadership roles at Cornell. And when you're in one of those roles, you're supposed to see the big picture. You can't just be an entomologist anymore. I'm also a parent. Climate change is personal going to affect my daughters. And lastly, the Homeland Security motto is, if you see something, say something, I'm here to say something. Okay, how many Trekkies? <laughs> Probably, how'd they get their food? Replicators, right? So what happens if they blew both their engines? Or out the, what was the guy, the Klingons? You know, they're incapacitated, they're lost out in space, in trouble. They had to be self-sufficient. Kind of looks like the same place, it's our situation. We don't have a whole lot of places to go. We've got to take care of what we have. And I think it's better to tell the truth, make you a little uncomfortable. So here we go. All right. This is the Endeavor. First time I saw this, what a remarkable selfie. But that orange band is the troposphere. Right here, about this part of the world, maybe five, six miles high. That's where the action occurs. That's where 80% of the climate change activity occurs. It's like a very, very thin blanket. Solar radiation comes down, hits the surface of the Earth. If it's white snow, most of that energy is reflected back. If it comes down and hits a dark surface, it's absorbed. That, some of that energy is then irradiated in, uh, as IR. And I just learned this the other day listening to Toby Alt. If you had a candle in your hand and you feel the warmth, is it the actual air that's warming up? It's not. It's the radiant energy. So it's that same kind of energy reflecting off the surface of the planet. Hits carbon, uh, greenhouse gases, which are essential to life on the planet, and some of those are reflected back. So we're simply adding more and more greenhouse gases to that thin little layer. That blanket is getting thicker. It is getting warmer. <coughs> One of, the carbon one of the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, on the bottom is year 1000 to year 2000. You can see the Industrial Revolution, how quickly things have changed when we started burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuel, uh, we should be at about 270 parts per million. We're now at 404, more or less, 40% above normal. If we keep going, business as usual will hit 900 parts per million. That means we'll have 60 days here in this part of the world above 90 degrees in the summertime. Very different. Nothing new. Tyndall and others had this worked out in the 1800s, what a greenhouse gas is all about. 
One of the things that I've had farmers say to me is when I mention this, carbon-12 is actually increasing the atmosphere and it comes from the burning of ancient plants or fossil fuels. It's another direct indicator that the burning of fossil fuels is changing the atmosphere. And I think this is 97 out of 100 scientists agree we are the cause, climate change is happening. I think it's now 99 out of 100. Pretty solid evidence. Another way to look at this is the atmosphere is a bathtub. We're filling it up with greenhouse gases. The natural systems, which would be the drain, the oceans, the plants, etc., to absorb the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, can no longer keep up. We're putting more water in, more greenhouse gases. The drain has not changed. The bathtub is filling up. The relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature, going back 400,000 years, we all know where these data come from. Ice cores, the, ice, the bubbles in ice, and if you look at the top, you can see how CO2 fluctuates over the years from 400,000 years to current time, and so does the temperature, very much aligned. CO2 decreases, temperature decreases. CO2 increases, temperature increases. And of course, here we are in current times going off the chart. Where does it come from? Transportation, about a third. Electricity production. Any idea how many cars are produced per day on the planet? I just forgot. <laughs> okay, I'll make something up. I think it's like 180,000 a day. Here we go. How many flights, commercial flights a day? 93,000. These are things we take, you know, we enjoy. There's my 93 Volvo up there. I still drive that. I drive. So electricity industry, but agriculture in the U.S. contributes about 10% of greenhouse gases. Worldwide, it's more like 18 to 20%. So it's not always fair to pro point one's finger at agriculture as a major. Yes, it's a contributor, but there's a lot of other sources of these greenhouse gases. So let's just summarize. We've gained about 1.5 degrees globally. It's warming twice as fast at the poles. The Iditarod, the dog sled race, every year now they're concerned they'll even have it and they keep moving further north. 2001, 2010, the hottest decade, 15, the hottest year. This year will surpass all previous years, hotter summers, warmer winters. Nights are warming faster than days. The rate of warming is very fast. We're gonna gain as much heat in the next 100 years as we have since the last ice age. And again, we can't turn this off. Even if we stopped and really behave today, it'll take hundreds if not thousands of years to sort of equilibrate. And the distinction between climate and weather, weather is what's happening outside today. Over short term, climate is decades in length. So we face a challenge, a grand challenge. The evidence, with a few exceptions, when I did my TEDx talk, we looked for great pictures of glaciers and we had this beautiful one. I thought, let me check. And it was actually highlighted because it was one of the few glaciers that's actually growing. We didn't use that picture. Glaciers are melting um, worldwide. This is an important source of irrigation water in Chile and a lot of other countries. Uh, if you haven't been to Glacier National Park, I suggest you get there soon because the glaciers will be gone in about 20 years. I'm talking to my daughters uh, about where they want to go next year, and they want to go to Glacier Park while the glaciers are still there. This is summer sea ice in the Arctic. This is a, actually, I looked just today at where we are with uh, retreating sea ice in the summertime. It rapidly freezes over and is rapidly freezing right now. But this is an image of in September and you can see it's about 700,000 square miles less than it should be when you compare to historical records. So here's an example of where solar radiation comes in. It's absorbed by that deep blue ocean, warms the water, melts more ice, you get it. 
there's actually uh, an, a concern as the passage is open here because it will, well, one, there's a military concern because of more Russian and Chinese transport, but also invasive species that exist in bilges and ships because the ships are going to get from point A to point B much faster. There's a likelihood of more of those kind of invasives being moved around the planet. Oceans are changing, 30% more acidic than they should be. The rising thermal expansion accounts for about a third of that. Much more comes from melting glaciers. glaciers. Obviously, I think most everyone's aware the acidification is affecting shell-forming organisms. How many have hugged a redwood? It's kind of hard not to, right? <laughs> uh, these, are these the largest creatures on Earth living? No? Okay, well, they're big. They're massive and they're hard not to hug. So in the Sierras, invasive species and other plants are moving up the Sierras because of warming conditions. So someone asked the question, what about the redwoods? Well, it turns out there's just this narrow band of perfect soil conditions for the redwoods. So in time, they're already under stress, but in time, they will be compromised by warming temperatures. Even these grand creatures. So let's talk about agriculture and food security. With all these changes, it's no longer business as usual. There's more variability, more risk. The impacts are local, local to global. Food production is moving north. We've essentially shifted close to one planting zone north. This obviously has impact for farmers in Manitoba where they expanded grain production. Growing seasons are longer. We've gained about 10 days here. Out west, it's more, 19. The northwest, 16 days. But that doesn't necessarily mean additional growing days for farmers because of more extreme weather. We're having wet spells in the spring or in the fall and interferes with harvest or planting. Some of our farmers have, uh, I heard Dave Wolf mention this a while back, where they're splitting their planting. They get in early while they have a dry period early spring with a long season corn and then they'll wait for the sort of the the wet spell, and then they'll come in with a short season corn later on, so they still get a crop. And we're having more heavy precipitation events, especially in the Northeast, we're up 71%. There was um, the Libby pumpkin, which grows 90% of their, excuse me, grows almost all their pumpkins within 90 miles of their processing facility in Illinois. In 2012, they had a very wet spring in 2004. 14, a very wet fall, uh, which meant planting or harvesting of pumpkins was compromised. I think in 2012, they had about half the crop they normally would, and they produce almost all the pumpkin pie, pie filling in the U.S. This is serious. <laughs> We're talking about pumpkin pie filling, but it's an example of diversification, spread out your risk. Don't plant all your pumpkins close to the plant. And this is a quote from a farmer uh, we've done some videos of farmers interviewing them, their perceptions of climate change, and it just happened to go to this, this farm right after a heavy downpour, and he had lost $80,000 worth of alfalfa seed. He had just planted it, but with the heavy rain, everything was washed away. As a farmer, you can weather the storm, but you can't weather continuous storms. Penyan, in 2014, they had five inches of rain in four hours. Ice slipped down on Long Island, had 18 inches in 24 hours. There's more of these uh, events are occurring. And this is where I really get into the climate change for job security sake. There are more insects, excuse me. The likelihood of, with longer seasons, more generations, uh, new invasives coming in, the bottom, the corn earworm down here, what is a pest primarily of sweet corn. Historically, when I started at Cornell, it was a late season corn, a late season pest. Now it's here year round, presumably, because now it can overwinter. Last week, there was a forum in Washington, D.C. on uh, climate and pest, and I heard Lou Ziska, a weed scientist, talk about some of his work, and it was just amazing. He found, uh, he had a call from someone in the ARS lab and said, we got this old seed that's like 60 years old. Should we throw it away? And he said, oh, yeah, sure. And then he went, wait a minute. That seed, those plants grew under much lower CO2 levels than what we have today. 
and he did some comparisons. There clearly the, the weeds have evolved. But he summarized his talk like this. Preliminary evidence suggests that weeds may impose greater limitations on crop production than earlier assumed. The worst weeds, often wild relatives of crop, may be able to better adapt to increase CO2 and temperature associated with future changes. At the same time, adaptation among wild weedy lines may serve as a means to enhance adaptation of cultivated lines, special, especially cereal lines, to increase production as CO2 increases. So we're going to both be fighting weeds but also learning from them. And there were several other stories at this forum on crop diseases and even insects, where there are just some of these subtle but kind of uh, scary changes that are occurring. This is an interesting prediction looking forward. The gray band is historical high and low average temperature by year from roughly 1850 to current times. And here's projections. The red line would be business as usual, worst case scenario. And what it shows is by 2050, the coldest year we will experience will be above any high temperature we've ever had pre the previous 150 years. We're moving essentially temperature band. And here we go. Watch carefully. This is average temperatures from the 1800s to 2100. This is going to show uh, increasing temperatures over the next 150 years. Now we're not supposed to go by 2 degrees C. That will happen at roughly 2028. 20, and by the end of the century, we're past 5 degrees C. Want to see that again? Oh. I have to tell one, 2 o'clock? No? 1? One. One ten. Okay. All right. We'll go through this one more time. Okay. That's looking forward in temperature. Let's look forward in precipitation patterns. Just find New York on the map, and you'll see it's darker blue and thatched. That means we'll have generally increase in overall precipitation, annual precipitation in the winter and the spring. Fall, so-so, summer's a little drier. But then look at the southwest. It's going to get drier and drier and drier. Does that mean that we here in the northeast have an opportunity to actually diversify and expand agriculture because we will have water in the coming years? Now, if anybody follows Toby Alt's work, there's two papers, one in 2015 and one in 2016. This is the risk of a mega drought. A mega drought is 35 years in length or greater. The two, the arrows point to mega droughts were uh, civilizations collapsed in, in the southwest back in 1150 and about 1300 because of long-term droughts. But the odds of us having a mega drought went from the first paper to 80% to 99% in the southwest. That has an extraordinary impact on agriculture in California, agriculture in Mexico, and uh, just communities there and cities as well. And, you know, if you can make a dollar on something, why not? There's a beer called Global Warmer. It's actually a very good beer. It's seasonal. I have no idea why it's seasonal, because I can't always get it. But the little on the back it said, extended refrigeration at retail magnifies beer's carbon footprint. Please enjoy as soon as possible. <laughs> Comes in a four pack. Okay, let's go out to dinner. So growing food is changing. Supply chains are changing. Price volatility is increasing. And I had the opportunity three, four years ago to actually meet with the president of Kraft Food at that time. She's a Cornell alum and I brought up climate change and she paused and said, Price volatility is costing us about $3 billion a year. We're a big company, but that's a lot of money. So this is a business issue as well. We've got to start with the right ingredients for a good meal. Agava, grown in northern Mexico, and it's been subject to the drought. It's a 10-year crop. It's under severe pressure. We're messing with tequila. 
cork trees around the Mediterranean with higher temperatures, the bark is changing. And they make like a billion corks a year. It's a big deal. But if you drink really good stuff that where the cork is important because there's a breathability issue, uh, that's changing. So your product will be different. And they're considering uh, synthetic corks, etc. But the cork trees are changing, which is having an impact on this, on these kind of beverages. Um, olives, some are grown in California. But the point there is California is starting to lose its winter chill, which is essential for fruit and many nut crops. And in the longer term, UCS did a report, and I think they're gonna, they said they're going to lose about 40% of their winter chill by the middle of the century. That's going to affect plums, peaches, pears, apricots, grapes, you name it, in the longer term. That's a kind of a ominous change or subtle change in the background that a lot of people don't fully appreciate. If you're producing uh, whiskey in Kentucky, the angel is getting a bigger share. There's evaporation through the oak barrels. The oak, oak barrels are stored essentially out of doors in, there's a term, they're buildings, but they're open to the outside. So as temperatures increase, there's more evaporation and more loss of alcohol through the oak. And it's actually enough that they're getting a little worried and they call that the angel share. Well, at least the angels are happy. Okay, salad. Uh, avocado production in California will be off about 40% in 30 years because of increasing temperatures. It's hard to grow organic tomatoes in this part of the world now because of these early heavy downpours and the risk of late blight, so they have to be grown under plastic. If you're gonna grow lettuce in Salinas Valley in the future, you'll probably need to switch to more uh, heat tolerant varieties. Uh, wine is affected because grapes are very sensitive to temperatures changes, so that's going to affect California grapes and maybe be an advantage for us. Grain production worldwide is off a little because of more extreme in weather. Lobsters off the coast of Maine, they've moved north 50 miles. The oceans off the coast of Maine are war warming eight times faster than most any other place on the planet. It's also affected the shrimp industry, which has pretty much crashed. If there were saffron in this rice, most saffron is grown in Iran, but about 10 to 15% is from Kashmir in India. Because of changes in precipitation patterns and temperatures, they're going out of business. And it's affecting thousands of farmers in that part of the world. And I don't, I don't even want to talk about this one, but yes, coffee. I happened to be in Costa Rica, as I mentioned a few years ago, and walked through some coffee plantations, and you know, it's getting warmer and warmer, so they simply move up the side of the mountains a little further, but obviously they're gonna run out of space. Uh, coffee, there's a coffee bore spreading worldwide, in part related to climate change, that's also impacting the industry. Uh, vanilla, grown on the coast of Madagascar, is moving inland because of more storms, increased transportation costs, cocoa, probably move from Western Africa to Central and South America. So the point is, if you go to, next time you go to a restaurant, just look at the, all that's available to us and change is occurring. But what if you're in a country poor, where agriculture is rain fed and you really have limited resources. So this, we face a food security challenge globally. So national security challenge, a moral challenge. There are arguments that the war in Syria started because of a long-term drought started driven by climate change. And actually, a few years ago, there was a conference on campus. Chris Barrett led it. This was not the one, the really big one last year, but about four or five years ago. It was actually funded by the CIA. They do that. Um, and they publish. They're in the background, but I was part of that sort of background dialogue, which was kind of interesting. So I was, had the honor or privilege of being in Vietnam in March, and here's a country, the Mekong, 17 million people living five feet above sea level. They're already affected by saltwater intrusion and some other complications, but it's a land and a people on water, which is just remarkable to watch, but you can also envision what would happen, what will happen with sea level rise, and they have also 2,000 miles of coastline. It's a beautiful country if anybody gets a chance to go there. Just remarkable and wonderful people. 
and just for the record, we're actually planning to take students there in January in one of the internationalizing Cornell curriculum programs to spend two weeks in the Mekon. Food security's in the news. The press picks this up, sharp swings in ingredient prices, we're aware of, so on. So there's this concern in the food industry. And another example of uh, a uh, potential conflict with rising waters in Bangladesh, and changing temperatures in India, movement of people, and multiple countries with nuclear weapons. And it's a moral issue. I'm sure you've heard the Pope came out in support of getting our act together. There have been religious summits, the Dalai Lama, Arch Desmond Tutu, etc. All right, we take a breath. We can get pretty depressed, overwhelmed by all of this. So I guess we could move, we could ignore, deny, we're all too busy. It's actually in part not in our DNA. We're not responsive to threats that are far in the future or somewhere else. We're more of the immediate. We respond to immediate threats. And generally, life is good and we're busy. Leave me alone. So the call to action. And if it's a short book written by Mary Piper it's called The Green Boat. And she lays out, and it's her personal story on how she, as one person, made a change related to climate change. It was actually related to energy. Become aware, listen to the science, accept it. This is the oh shoot moment, or otherwise, and then act. And I love this quote from Zorba the Greek, to live is to roll up your sleeves and embrace trouble. And I think we've got something to put our arms around right here at Cornell. So I'm going to talk about some of the things going on here at Cornell, both on the sort of the academic side, but also the operations facility side. I think you're all aware this is a land grant, but in particular, we have incredible strength in climate change and agriculture. We have much uh, capacity beyond that, but we have particular strength at the nexus of climate change and agriculture. And I made a list of some of the things going on, and there's many more. Uh, strengths in plant breeding, soil health, nutrient management, hot cows give less milk. I sometimes show a picture of some research out of UC Davis, and it shows a picture of a dairy cow on a platform, and there's a shower. The cow is getting a shower. And the, the idea was a cow comes in, gets a shower, cools off, and leaves. The trouble is the cows didn't leave. They just stayed there, so they had to put a little kicking device to get the cows to move on. We have exceptional talent in communications and climate change, water management, IPM, et cetera. We have the Northeast Climate Center. It's a collaborative environment. It's the right place to take on this challenge. We have the Atkinson Center. Innovative research. They have a climate forum, making connections through topical lunches. Some new initiatives, the U.S. Climate Change Hubs, created in 2014. There's actually a sub-hub sub on campus at the ARS facility, uh, but their, their agenda is to bring all parties together, land grants, extension, stakeholders, non- or NGOs, et cetera, and coordinate their efforts. There's also the relatively new Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions, which focuses primarily on agriculture, right now the Climate Smart Farming Program. This is an example of what's happening, the Climate Smart Farm Extension Team. This is the first in the country where six of our educators actually have part of their responsibility is to work on climate change. They're distributed around the state. They have different responsibilities. Most are with regional teams. And the other thing being developed by the Institute are tools. There's a growing degree day tool. We don't do it. These are the faculty and programmers, et cetera. We help facilitate this. There's a freeze risk tool. And somewhat relevant to this drought for this last year, there's also an irrigation scheduler that looks out 30 days and gives probability about uh, plant stress given different scenarios. And you can put in soil type. You can put in crop type. You can put in location. And it'll give it for your particular, this kind of a prediction for your particular farm or location. 
So Cornell, walking the walk. I'm not sure how many follow this, but we are now committed to carbon neutrality by 2035. That's a really big deal. It's a really big challenge. We have a, core, a climate action plan that's been around for several years that has something like 60 recommendations to help us get to a lower carbon footprint. Uh, two years ago, there was an acceleration working group saying, how do we speed that all up? I co-chaired that. More recently, there's a senior leadership campus committee that just released their report a couple weeks ago on how to get us to carbon neutrality. As mentioned early on, there's also the President's Sustainable Campus Committee. They have responsibility for implementation of a lot of these recommendations. And as an institution, we're a living laboratory. Our faculty and staff can work on these issues together. And it's a big place. 21,000 students, 1,600 faculty, 8,000 staff, 600 buildings, 2,000 acres of land, 25,000 light switches, annual about 40 Here's, this summarizes the greenhouse gas emissions. This is basically 2008 to 2014. In 2010, we went from coal to buying heat and power plant, or natural gas. So this shows the combustion emissions, obviously dropped in 2010 when we got off coal. We have to buy electricity, but we're buying less after 2010 because now we produce a lot of it. Commuting is a big deal. A lot of travel, believe it or not, sports teams do a lot of travel. Air travel, and then some of this is offset a little bit by forest sequestration and the fact that uh, we're also selling, on occasion, electricity. And um, this shows the net emissions, essentially a 30% decrease over that time span and at the same time, an energy conservation initiative helped the campus actually grew by about 20%. Mike, why does it appear that it has gone back up slightly in 2014? Unusually cold winter in 2014. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bear with me. What time? Uh, well done. So, 10 minutes. Okay. All right. I'll just summarize rather quickly what has been done. I think you're familiar with lake source cooling. This has reduced energy use to cool the campus by 86%. The combined heat and power plant, if anybody ever had a chance to tour that, it's essentially two 747 jet engines running on natural gas. They're producing electricity and the heat, the exhaust creates steam. It's all captured instead of wasted. Solar power, if you fly in and out of Ithaca Airport, I'm sure you've seen the solar array out there. There's now one at Geneva. I think the Black Oak project, the wind project, is, has the green light. I'm not absolutely sure, but Cornell is one of the few, if not the only, universities in the world, or the U.S., that has a hydroelectric plant, produces all of 1% of our electricity. It used to produce all of it. <laughs> Lead buildings. Anybody know what's wrong with the, the gates? building right there. You see those fins? They're directly connected by metal to the inside, so there's a transfer of heat out or cold in and out. And it's, you know, This is one of the things that's changing with the new codes. Don't, bear with me, don't let deans and architects put up buildings. You need an energy person there as well. Because they gotta look pretty and you know, et cetera. Uh, energy conservation, if you play tennis, they put new lights out there, saving a lot of money, like $20,000 per year in energy cost. And there's a, about 50 buildings on campus have this dashboard. So I went this morning and I checked on Bradfield, probably not the best building to do this, and how much energy was used. But so far this week, starting Monday at 12 a.m. to roughly a few minutes ago, uh, 40,000 kilowatt hours of electricity for Bradfield. Um, $3,600 in cost and 36,600 pounds of CO2 to operate that building. For the entire year, it costs about $300,000 a year. You can, this is pretty easy, pretty handy. You can go in and type in any building. It gives kind of immediate feedback on energy use in a building. Not only electricity, but also chilled water and uh, heat. Um, 
This is a, will reflect the energy conservation. These are new buildings that were built over the year. The dark line is square footed, square, uh, gross square feet. You can see the quite an increase from the year 2000 to 2016. This is steam sales, flat. Electrical sales, flat. Chilled water, flat, despite a very large increase in our number of buildings and square footage. This reflects the effort that the facilities and sustainability office put into this. So the carbon neutrality by 2035. Typically these are driven by financial reasons. This as a quadruple bottom line. Does the solution help Cornell fulfill its academic mission and purpose? Does it meet the needs of the people on campus and the communities? Will it enhance overall prosperity for the campus and the region? Does it support a sustainable planet? It also includes natural gas and the leakage issue. Solutions for tomorrow, the big one is earth sort heat, digging down about two miles to tap the warmth and uh, deep rock and using that to in part heat the campus. There's heat pumps, nuclear was actually considered, or we can just buy our way out of this through offsets. That's looking in the longer term. This is a depiction of also called deep rock geothermal, going down 10 to 30,000 feet. This is a, not a trivial investment, very expensive, and it'll be initially experimental. More short term, what do we do? Build more high performance buildings, conserve energy, uh, switch over as much as possible to electrical vehicle, increase our capacity. There's this thing called Think Big, Live Green, which is um, really all of us participating in doing what we can in our offices and labor laboratories. There's also a campus climate, huh, not campus campus literacy, it's climate campus literacy. I personally don't think anybody should graduate from this institution without being fully aware of what climate change means to their life. It's a living laboratory, and uh, this climate literacy is the why we're doing it. And there's two working groups that are going to be formed, one focused on climate literacy, how do we incorporate more of that into experiences for students and our staff and faculty, and also a group coming together and how do we really change behavior. And when I say group, these are the faculty, working with staff, the faculty have the expertise. And I have a personal issue with windows open when it's 100 degrees outside. This one's pretty close to home. This is Kennedy. One day I walked up to Kennedy and Roberts Hall and there were 13 windows open and the AC's running. Helen Newman, I'm in the gym. My hair is getting messed up because the air conditioner is blowing so hard. The door's wide open. Some of this stuff just simple behavior changes could really make a difference. I would just love to have a group of students having the opportunity to wander around campus and just start sort of grading occupants. These are really simple things, but in fact, they're, they're game changers. Um, is it possible for the faculty to work with staff to make these kind of changes? This is Cal's Green that happened in 2011. Energy conservation in several buildings. The winner was Barton Lab in Geneva, but in one year we saved about $230,000 230, in energy costs, two million pounds of CO2. Those are the simple things. As the experiment station, which I was director of, we adopted a culture of sustainability. Where st people were empowered to find better ways of doing things. There was actually a sustainable action team. One of the things they did on their own was to reduce the greenhouse footprint by 25,000 square feet saving a college three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year. They also designed a better growth chamber that uses 85 percent less energy. So, it's a grand challenge. We can tackle this if we have the will. And look what we've accomplished as a species. Art, disease, gone to the moon. We have these things called iPhones, technology, agriculture, engineering, we can do remarkable things, but we have to decide we really want to do it. So I challenge all of us, get informed, stay informed, accept the truth. Making it personal helps. Leading is also a good thing, and raise your voices. And it's personal. Two alums from Cornell, 06 and 10. 
when they look back, what are they going to say? Why didn't they take action? Thank you. spectroscopy and some PCAP. And um, I think the talk is really good. I think we need, really need to focus on adaptation. And I think sometimes people can get distracted by the CO2 
effect is the new calculation show it doesn't take much CO2 to raise the temperature. And those days that the new calculations coming out doing a time, you know, doing spectroscopy analysis. So I think in even keeping the um, carbon neutrality is very important. But it could be as low as this effect could be seen as low as 50 parts per million carbon dioxide. So that means it's that makes it really scary because it's not going to take much, just any more increase in solar radiation and our temperatures are going to keep going up. So I just might please don't get too distracted by the CO2. Okay. And don't, so we can focus on the adaptation. Yeah. So I, I, I get, I get talk yesterday, I was getting one tonight. I'll give one tomorrow too. And there, there's another slide to this, because you also see, we're also seeing more and more solar and it's contributing more to our electric production. I need, I want to make, there's hope here. <laughs> yeah, there is. The term that comes up and it actually was mentioned in the presidential debate called clean coal. Can you highlight that and what that is? So okay. uh, is it the Nazi moron? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I'm being. No, I'm sorry. Who's that? There is no sulfur, right? That's the idea. Is it lower sulfur? That's yeah, and some of the other contaminants, but not necessarily CO2. Um, I didn't quite understand you correctly. You said that the contribution of adaptation is Yeah, we're about 10 percent globally. It's 18 to 20 percent. Is that because of the difference in agriculture, or is that because of other places, things like like transportation issues or whatever? I think in part it's agriculture because of rice production. Is anybody helping me out on that? Well, agriculture is a large part of the GDP for a lot of those countries. We have also a lot of energy use in, in industries. That's probably the primary reason. It's just relative. Another problem with those statistics is there's a lot of embodied energy and embodied greenhouse gas emissions in what we import. So actually our footprint is much larger than it appears if you just analyze the emissions country by country. It is disproportionate though. 10% of our GDP Agriculture is not 10% of our GDP, it's much less. It's like 3% or 4%. So it's still a disproportionate impact on agriculture. Yes, so thank you for the presentation, Ed. I thought it felt really nice to know, like, we can all do these small parts to decrease our own energy usage. But isn't it? if we do our small part, but it is such an insignificant part still, and that we're all operating on this very high energy environment, and we justify it because we are working in things like better climate change environment, and, and we're all working towards some greater goal, but what is Cornell University doing as an institution to systematically change this high energy Okay. Well, I tried to share as much as I could of what Cornell is doing if you're referring to it on the operations side. Um, but, I do a lot more. But, but as an advocacy of, of like, the university as a whole, you know, you're talking to <coughs> the person at Kraft, but who else is Cornell talking to? There are some major players. I'm not. Please around this your question. I'm sorry. I just happened to look at some upper administration positions across the country, provost being climate change is not included in those job descriptions. That being that find that pretty sad. Um, I think we have trustees that don't believe in climate change. Um, it's an uphill battle. <laughs> I hear, I wonder, like, when you think about, okay, that the Southwest is going to, you know, get drier and agriculture is going to be moved um, to another, centralized somewhere else, I guess I fear that we will just repeat the same issues with centralized agriculture. I mean, maybe we'll have new energy sources and things like that, but we'll still have this great demand to move 
stuff around, uh, for fertilizer, for, you know, all that stuff. Like, so it feels like to me, is where I guess I question, are there um, as many efforts going towards some kind of, I know that it's happening at a grassroots level um, to see, decentralize some of agriculture, but I do have this fear that we'll just move it somewhere else. Um, and still have the distribution question, transportation costs and all that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, energy needs. Yeah. Harold knows the answer to that one. <laughs> um, let's hope not. Uh, I mean, I'm just, we're in the process of trying to put together a USDA proposal right now that looks at the Northeast and preparing for climate change. And it has transportation components. It has the whole food chain involved. We're trying to get them all in the room, kind of layout scenarios of what it's going to look like in the future and how do we work together. That's my answer. It's very complicated, enormous amounts of money, a lot of food grown in the wrong places. And then you think of global shocks. Uh, and what, what if California agriculture does collapse there in 2060? What does that mean globally? Where's the city? New York City going to get its food there? Actually, I was contract, uh, contacted a while back by someone in New York City trying to find a group of, a consulting group that would come in and help them understand where the food comes from because of climate change. Mm -hmm. but I, that's kind of the driver. If you get the yeah. metropolitan areas asking those questions, then we can yeah. make some change. One more question, please. It seems to me like some, some worthwhile work, too, would just be in the, on the consumer level about this yep. idea of eating locally and not eating everything every season, you know, and that's all that. One more. Okay. What do you like? We have a greenhouse and food bus operation, so we're trying to do it centrally. We have kind of corn grain stove and a pellet stove, so we can <laughs> reduce the And I think we're selling out of all of our tomatoes. You know, so local production, because you can make it fresh, you can have it taste good, so it still tastes all of its flavor and of all its nutrients, and if it's done locally, it is a way to adapt to climate change, and it does work. Well, and market it as lower carbon footprint. That's <coughs> and we're selling them all out. All right, let's type my dog. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.